surely, surely. Surely, let's pray. Gracious and Holy Father, bless you. Bless you for life. Bless you for new life in Jesus. Bless you for your spirit who binds us together in his body. Thank you for this little gathering today. Thank you for the technology that makes it possible. Thank you for this incredible diaspora of interested people in TF's wonderful work. Thank you for his legacy. Thank you for this first of a volume of 12. Mm. Bless you for this saint and brother of God. Mm. So we pray for our conversation that you would imbue it with the Spirit's power. You would enlighten us to know the glorious riches mm. that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bryden. Well, today, today begins the first of 12 sessions that will be on the series Theology and Science at the Frontiers of Knowledge, which T.F. Torrance was the editor for the series and wrote this first volume that we're looking at today. So each month I will have a similar kind of structure unless you tell me it's not working for you. So um, if you haven't gotten the handout, I did post a handout on the reading group page. So that will be of some help and I will, I'll use that as I go through and hopefully that will be posted as well with the, um, the session on the TF Torrance reading group page on the TF Torrance Fellowship where all of these things get ultimately ended up and recorded. I've been getting them up usually within a day or two. So we have a good, a good rhythm going with that. So today we are looking at this book, which this was the original, original version of it. I don't have the dust cover for this one, but it, you know, it's quite a thin volume. And then this, this is the volume that I've been using. It's a important book for the work that I'm doing. This is a, the Wiffenstock edition of the book. And it has the new forward and an index, which the original did not have. So the nature of, of this book is that it is one that is accessible where, what do you what do you have there, Bill? Oh, it's the same one Bryden has, I think. Oh, you've got the dust cover. See, so you're ahead of me. Yeah. Oh, no, I, no, no, no. No, this is the uh, the original, I think. It is the original, but mine's the original without the dust cover. If you took your dust cover off, it would look like, it would well, look like mine. I found a great, Desk, uh, dust cover because it was covered with plastic. I got it for nine bucks. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> you well did good. Done. Well done. Yeah. It doesn't have a mark in it, except I've started to put little tiny marks. And... Right. Well, this is an important book for the work that I'm doing on uh, the science of the personal, indwell and expanding the methodology of TF Torrance. This book really begins to enter into scientific thinking as applied to what it means to engage a personal God, and particularly the triune God as chapter six talks about. And to uh, really, for the purpose of this series on theology and science to really begin to lay out why is scientific methodology important for understanding the work of theology. So the uh, does anybody have any questions so far? I mean, oh. Yeah, I just wanted to say I thought the uh, the review by David Ford was very helpful. Sure. That uh, that that's a very nice. I went through that. I, I really focused on that quite yeah. a bit. So yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. And so I, I, well, I I agree. Sorry, if it, yeah, I agree, Bill. And that's why I posted my own response to that review. Um, I I had a couple of big conversations with David. Um, uh, you know, at that Swanick confer conference that uh, Leslie Newbigin organized in the mm. early 1990s back in, in England. And he, he, he's a very gracious man. He is. He, he, he really is. And I mean, OK, he's retired now, Regis Professor from Cambridge. But certainly his work is worth looking at. And the very latest is a, is a Gospel of John, a theological interpretation, which I'm still debating whether to acquire or not. I mine's on my way on the way I sat in on the session at the AAR where he was there on a panel and talking about uh, that oh. book so I'm looking forward to that coming out 
partly oh, for wow. its content, but also for the nature of it, sounds like a different reading of the Gospel of John that's much more personally involved, which always engages me. But I also gave yeah, yeah. him a copy of my Carl Bart, first Carl oh, Bart book, too. So course, he was looking forward course. to that. So, of course. So. <laughs> So the other thing I want to point out, I didn't post this one, and I'll just show you that it, I do have the copy of it. It's called The Truth of Tradition, Critical Realism in the Thought of Alistair McIntyre and T.F. Torrance by Professor P. Mark. It's A-C-H-T-E-M-E-I-E-R. How do you say yeah. that? Act, uh, act timer? Yeah. <laughs> that works? Yeah, and that so works. His, his first sentence, I have found myself very much drawn to the epistemological realism which T.F. Torrance put forward in his 1985 book, Reality and Scientific Theology. So he engages that in a work by um, Alistair McIntyre. And in the end, he says, though I, I originally saw them as quite distinct, um, the two of them actually do work well together. I just I didn't want to overwhelm people um, with secondary reading when there's a lot to read in this in this book itself. I'm, recently, intense... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I no. recently read that it was T.F. Torrance that was the first one to refer to Karl Barth's theology as critical realism. You familiar with that? That is possible. Um, T.F. Torrance did write two books. He, 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 this author referenced. Yeah, this is the later one that he wrote. Yes, yes. He, Torrance, uh, and then the earlier one. What's the er, what does it say? I can't see that. It's Karl Barth, an introduction to his early theology, oh, 1910. Oh, yeah, the early. I've got I've got the earlier one. I don't have the the one, the first one you held up. That's the yeah. one that this author referenced uh and making that. Oh, there's uh JR has uh uh-huh. Yeah. But he he cites Torrance as being the first one to refer to Karl Barth's work as critical realism. Right. Well, he's I, I have not particularly seen that, but it's certainly possible. It's just something that hasn't been on my radar. So it's something worth worth conferring. The whole uh, question gotta, of what is meant by it is another thing. Uh, so go ahead. Well, I, I just said I've got I've got a, a request in from the library to get that book. I it looks a little pricey online, so uh, right. I just want to look at the citations that he has. Right. I had but, an interview this week for the Carl Bart podcast, and at the end, he wanted to know which primary text and which secondary text would you have if you were to be on a desert island of Carl <laughs> Bart's work. And this was the secondary text that I chose. Was this this later one? It's a it's a wonderful review of Bart's life, and it's torrent, so it gives you the two of them in a sense together. So. Evangelical theology was my primary text. So if I end up on a desert island with two books. Yep. 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 Would you say that critical realism in Torrance's theology is a response to an interpretation of the self revelation of God and Jesus Christ? Uh, I'll say I wrote... that the nature of, of the word that you've been um, unpacking <laughs> that is heuristic, yeah. critical. Critical realism is the looking at our words, language, concepts to see if they are true to the nature of what it is that is there. So it's a discovery process that attends to how well our words are, are pointing to that it, which we are trying to engage. So T.F. Um, said in one of his lectures, people think that critical thinking is thinking about the object of our study. No, the criticism is of our own thinking and the words that we're putting forward. And again, that's very consistent with the very opening section one of the church dogmatics. As a scientific discipline, Christian dogmatics is the church's scientific self-examination of its distinctive talk about God. So mm -hmm. that whole recognition that there is a process of learning and we have to be self-critical in the process to make sure that it's true to particularly the one who we are studying. Alistair McGrath, whom Ryden knows quite well. Quite well, yes. Uh, actually cites a paragraph from N.T. Wright for, uh, is, uh, he, he praises him as uh, his definition of critical realism in, mm. in uh, T.F. Torrance intellectual biography. Right. I was 
surprised to see that, but that was very helpful to me to to read that from right uh, on right. that definition. So right, yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yep, agree. yeah, agreed. Right. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I have I have my Oxford cup here today for Bryden. So I'm I'm wow. drinking licorice wow. licorice tea. Licorice oh. tea. Licorice, oh. yeah. <laughs> it's quite good. Oh, yeah. So, so our goal today is to um, attempt to get an overview of this book. Each of these sessions will attempt to engage the book as a whole and will attempt to take on some smaller parts to it. Earlier in the week, I posted that Google Books has the first 50 pages of this book for those of you who don't own the book, Reality and Scientific Theology. So it's accessible um, in those opening chapters, which will be uh, helpful for our purpose today, including the table of contents and other things that give some picture of the whole. Uh, the preface also has some good helpful things of the whole. So um, each each week or each month, actually, we'll do this once once a month. Um, we'll do we'll attempt to do kind of an engagement like this, looking at the big picture and then some specific parts, just to get a sense of the way Torrance chose these people is adding to a conversation about the nature of science and theology and their engagement with the frontiers of knowledge, which is a very heuristic kind of statement, right? We're going on an adventure. That's right. We're going to learn. We're going to be at the frontiers, and we're going to have you know two guides in that adventure, and that will be theology and science. A journey so, of discovery. A journey of discovery. That's exactly right. Okay. So this book lays a foundation for scientific theological thinking that will be expanded in other the other 11 books in the Theology and Science at the Frontiers of Knowledge series. So this book is foundational in a sense. It lays principles that Torrance saw important. And I think to say everything that is done by other people, um, for the most part, lives within what it is that Torrance is laying out here. So beginning point, guide, there's other ways we could talk about this first book. So I've written a little nutshell here. This is an attempt to summarize the chapters all just in a few sentences. So there are six chapters in this book as outlined below. Torrance views the history of scientific thinking. He then clarifies what proper natural theology looks like in its proper and improper modes. Then the science of God becomes focal, working with the givenness of God. This approach is engaged in the human community to discuss and explore the God who meets us. The scientific character of the task calls us to recognize strata or levels of depth we must pursue to become scientific. Finally, this leads us to the Trinity as the God who is revealed and acknowledged in the scientific process. So, Bryden, Bryden's going to be leaving in an hour and he, he said he didn't think he might be here for points five and six i think it's five and six isn't it the uh the strata no it's the oh, social, no, the social yeah the social, yeah, the social stuff. and then the trinity yeah, yeah so yeah. i want yeah, four and six. because we've just laid out the foundation there um you can can at least in an introductory way give the comments that you have to help us to understand uh, the, what what you want to say on those points so that we have them in mind as we clear our lenses, get out our spray and clean our lenses. Whoa, what happened? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's neat. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to congratulate you, Marty, on that nutshell. I mean, I read the nutshell and just quietly spiraled mm. upwards. It was tremendous. Mm. I mean, seriously, because. This is a very dense book, and 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 you and you really have to stop and pause and stop and pause, but it's a beautiful book. Uh, I was lucky to read it fairly early on in my doctoral stuff in the sort of mid mid to late eighties, and, and and I must say it, it's lovely. Just mm. two things quickly, because yeah. I think there is a sequence that Torrance pursues for a reason, so I don't really want to hijack things, but. Uh, chapter four, if if you've got the handout printed out, folks, it's the social coefficient of knowledge, pages 98 to 130. Right. So what's going on there is that we are actually members of a community. Mm -hmm. And that social dynamic 
of sharing in the body of Christ has implications for our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, again, I, I wanted to flag Michael Polanyi, a very early book of his called Science, Faith and Society. Now, I was very lucky, very blessed. I had a school chaplain who in the sixth form gave us precocious kids. Uh, I was 16, 17 at the time. Come on. I mean, you know, it's crazy stuff. Um, his name is Hugh Dickinson. He became the dean of Coventry Cathedral eventually. And the paperback had just come out in 1964. So in, in, in 67, he gave us this book to read. I mean, you know, yeah, precocious kids. And I've never, I've still got the copy. Huh. And science, faith and society, that's a, a triangulation of, of, of things that are not often um, kind of put together. Yes. And, 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 and I want to insist on that because this chapter, chapter four, says exactly the same thing in different ways mm. and focuses it in different ways. Um, we now talk about social constructionism and the social coefficient of our knowledge. The trouble with social constructionism is it destroys critical realism. In fact, it's an anti-realism in the debate that is a, you know, an, ep an, ep an epistemological kind of snowstorm, um, which is really quite important. And Alistair McGrath in his big trilogy, A Scientific Theology, has a, excuse the pun, a mediating position. He, he talks about social mediation. He doesn't talk about social construction. He right. talks about social mediation, which is the same as the social coefficient. Because we humans are knowing subjects. And you're absolutely right in your heuristic comments. I've, I've thrown up there a, a T.F. Torrance use of the word paradigmata, which again, I latched onto very early on in reading Torrance. I think it's in Science, Faith and Incarnation, by the way. I think that's where he uh, dwells on the word. Hmm. Um, and of course, it's all about container space versus Einstein faith. So that's all I really want to say is that if you want to pursue chapter four, yep. you can go in a tangential way through Michael Polanyi. And then lastly, I will say that it highlights the use of tradition and traditioning institutions, which collectively embody human engagement with reality. Right. And, and, and therefore we're thrown into a multicultural environment nowadays because cultural anthropology is mostly, mostly a post-structural social constructionist game in just about every university that I know of. So yeah. they're both helpful and I'm dare to say almost demonizing. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's it, it's it's very serious. In fact, what's going on? But that's yeah. a kind of that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, and to say social constructivism for those who may not have studied much of that, that is to say that the society Sorry, yes. creates the ideas rather than doing what Torrance says that what we are studying fills out our ideas. The society, in a sense, binds together with a common belief that could become a form of group think. We all think this together, therefore it becomes truth by virtue of the human creating something that makes sense to them, so. Yeah, and and, and I will quickly flag so, uh, Charles Taylor, the Canadian. He talks yeah. about the social imaginary. And I'll also talk about that beautiful phrase of Paul Recurs, which is the available believable. What do communities or societies have that's available to be believed? You know, what's their framework that's available to think? You know, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, very, very helpful. I mean, Paul Ricoeur, yeah. social, social, uh, uh, Peter Berger, of course, Peter and Berger's so on and so on. The, the sacred yeah. God canopy, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so I mean, all of that is another way of saying natural theology, right? What, what yeah, is taking but what from the what kind human, of natural theology? <laughs> well, it's, a, it's the kind that, that he's critiquing in his chapter two. Yes, right. it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it Thank is. you. So anyway, yeah, lead in. Lead in. Onward and upward. I see that there are some comments. I need to put up my comment thing over here. Um, there are links for all podcasts. I'm trying to think, Howard, which podcast um, are you referring to? Well, the one that you mentioned at the beginning of the Zoom, the some bark something or another. I 
I had not heard oh, of it the, before. Uh, it was just recorded this last week. So uh, it is, it's called the BART Podcast. Corey Tuttle, oh. who's at the University of Aberdeen, okay. is the host in that. And um, I'm not sure exactly when he'll be able to post it. I've, I've been getting a number of podcasts. I have three of them lined up over the next few weeks here um, from a variety of places, including Canada and the UK. So it's uh, fun to be All able right. to talk about Carl Bart in that context. Okay, could you give me the, the name of the, the of the of the person who leads Corey the podcast? Tuttle. Corey Tuttle. Okay. He happens to be from the Pacific Northwest, so he's from my part of the world, but he's at Aberdeen right now. Okay. His doctoral work is actually on Bonhoeffer, but he's also very interested in Bart as well, and so does this. Okay. And the Polanyi book, Bill, you're asking about, that's science... Uh, faith and society is that right Bryden? yep it's going up right now perfect good at some point we will we'll engage some specific torrance polanyi kind of conversations it's possible at some point to also do some specific polanyi work we will come across polanyi regularly in these 12 books yep. <laughs> as one can imagine so yeah, what a what a beautiful man. So again, just looking at the uh, the chapter titles, the classical and modern attitudes of the mind is chapter one, the status of natural theology, which again, this is a place where, as Brian was just pointing out, there is a acknowledgement of a kind of natural theology that's problematic and a, an attempt to weave a way forward. The science of God. Um, when we use the word science, he's trying to take a proper methodology and say, we need to then, in our study of God, to do theology properly, use methods that, in fact, correlate with the scientific method. The social coefficient. Can you say anything about the word coefficient? I don't use the word coefficient very often. Coefficient, the thing that works together with. The thing that works together with. So the social working together of humanity with God or with just with one another? both and also with oh. knowing generally i mean it okay we're talking about reality here you see yeah so it's part of the heuristic process the coefficient is the heuristic process of working together in the investigative process or what michael polanyi calls being a society of explorers we need yeah, each and, other to explore together and to correct and point yeah. and and travis was very good the other day i mean he he hits the nail on the head often, Travis. He he is good. He's got a lot of energy too. <laughs> and then chapter five, the stratification of truth. Again, this whole nature that um, we tend to kind of have this sense that science just looks at the world and studies things in a kind of a surface kind of way. But Torrance is saying no, that isn't really how it works. We there's an investigative process that gets gets much deeper, and we'll we'll look a little bit more at that. But if you could even just think out of Kerry Magruder's geology kind of illustration, you can look at a, a rock outcropping and go, oh, rock. <laughs> and that is one level. And then a geologist says, do you know the story behind that rock? And they begin to tell you about the nature of how it was formed and the historical processes that would have would have been involved. And then he says, and to look even further, we need to look at you know the earth and its tectonic processes and the history of the ice ages and all those things. It's a deeper look into a scientific looking beyond, but it's just a rock, but there's so much there, layers <laughs> to be told. And every one of them is important. Uh, chapter six, again, ties very nicely with what it was that we looked at last week in Travis's talk about the Trinitarian structure of theology, that if we're gonna do science properly with God, we will ultimately have to see through the lens of the Trinity as that revealing that God gives us so that we can know God and to just look at Jesus or to just look at the Bible and not get to the persons of Trinity, any any one of those is not seeing as deeply as needs to happen to see into the very character of God. So those are the chapters and we're gonna, gonna go th through here then um, at a fair pace and try and really get a sense of the flow of logic that Torrance is attempting to lay in this chapter. 
So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, we're just going to keep moving along, but that doesn't mean we're not interested. So the chapter seeks to clarify the difference between basic attitudes of mind related to a classical or objective approach, um, which he, he has uh, going back to the very, the very early church in that to knowledge and a modern or constructivist approach to knowledge. And the nature of the constructivist, as Brighton was just pointing out, is that the human ends up creating something that may or may not be true, particularly to the nature of God. And so particularly in movements like anti-realism or God is dead or any of those are humanly conceived constructions. Um, someone who basically says, well, that doesn't make sense to me, <laughs> is living within their con construct of what it is that they think God might be. And that would be broadly within a modern a modern view that it's got to make sense to the human or it just isn't real. So the Christian belief is shaped by the dynamic interaction between God and the world. So the word dynamic here is to say that science itself has a dynamic interrelation and particularly with God, not only creating, but continuously sustaining its order. It demands that full consideration be given to the connection between the rational structures of the created universe and their source in the transcendent rationality of God. So T.F. Torrance's book, Divine and, Con and Contingent Order, will say God creates an orderly world. That is the order that is there. And therefore, there can be a human observation of the nature of what is given. We can begin to see order within that. We can see that um, all is not chaos. All is not random, but that there is something that actually creates uh, what we call rational structures of thinking because we go, oh, there's water and oh, there's land and oh, there's sky. Um, they're all together, but we can distinguish them and say there is an orderliness between them all um, that begins to allow our language to direct us to the things that we that we see. And again, with Micah Polanyi, we always no more than we can say. So at any moment, you're taking in all kinds of things in the world, but we have to select the things that we particularly focus on. And so to say human rationality at some level is the selected elements of the world that we give language to and ultimately then um, give some sense of the priority of that um, in, in shaping what we would call the findings of science. So this juxtaposition between God and the world um, raises the possibility of the problem of radical dualism of an epistemological kind, which is different in different ways has long troubled science and theology together. So radical dualism, um, there's so many ways to say it's in my head or it's in the physical world. So spiritual, material, um, inward, outward, any one of those would be a dualistic reading that Torrance is saying here is missing the point on what it means to have a science that is based on what it is that God is about. If you just choose what's in your head, that ends up being something that would be called idealism. And so a lot of theology talks about a God who's out there, the ideas in one's head, but it doesn't actually take us to the place where we engage God. And the physical world, um, much of the physical world, uh, if I haven't seen God, then I can't believe in God is, is simply a sense that if it's not physical, then I can't believe it. And so God gets dismissed and is seen to be merely part of the ideal world or the spiritual world or something that dismisses God off. And Torrance is going to say that breaking of the world apart is simply violating the very nature of what science would do. And that is to see see these things together. And I'd say the third way is really the word that Michael Polanyi uses, and that is to have a personal knowledge. Personal knowledge engages the world, reflects on the world, comes up with language about it, says to other members of the community, here's what I found, what do you think? And they say, well, that sounds good, but this part seems to be missing something. And so the community who reflects is part of the attitude of mind that Torrance is laying out there 
for the Christian community being the scientific community who engages the God who is there. And then in our reflection, we clarify, correct, do whatever is necessary to, to move beyond that. So Brian's been throwing up some good things here. Social constructionist, plausibility structures, social imaginary, available believability, all they're believable, all terms pointing to these social ponds we swim in, like fish, our gills naturally, and obviously processing the water. And in New Zealand, they have wonderful fish in the water there, so that's good. So revelation offers filters, but even these are heuristically processed. Say a little bit about the filters and what it means to heuristically process them. Well, I mean, Torrance in this book is saying, hey, we're in an interplay the whole time. But this interplay doesn't start from scratch. It starts from a thing called space-time history, Israel, Jesus, the church. Yep. Yep. And, 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 and as we interact all together in this company, and I love that word company, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we read books in company with Augustine, with Thomas, with Bart, and now this lovely man, T.F., and, and, and here we are on a Zoom thing in each other's company. And, 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 and I think that we have to see this. But the filters, the problem is that you and I, well, you know, we've got a bit of QE-itis. Uh, you've got plenty of Yankee doodle. And as to the Irish, well, God save the Irish. I'm married to one. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's game on. Uh, the, the, these, these culturally, socially positioned creatures that we are, you know, we, we have these blinkers. And I have to say to Marty, Marty, take your blinkers off, boy. And Marty has to say, oh, Bryden, just get real. And, and, and that's what I mean by the filters have to be processed. There we right. go. That'll do. That'll Good. do. Good. And Howard has a question for you, or it's a statement. Well, there's a question mark at the end. There is an old story where an old fish swam past a couple of young ones and asked them, how's the water? And they replied, what water? <laughs> okay, I, I can't resist. I start my theology and culture lectures with two statements. The last creature to ask questions of the water is the fish. Statement one. Statement two. The first time a fish knows itself to be the creature that it is, is when it's caught and on dry land. Oops. <laughs> and all the students look at me as if I'm completely mad, which is which may be correct. So there we go. Yes. Wonderfully mad. We we appreciate the nature of your madness. <laughs> so that is good. Okay. So we are dealing then with these attitudes, uh, the question of, of what is reality. And I meant to point out reality is the first word in the title. Um, he hasn't done a lot of work tying what reality is but to say reality is that which is other than us but in which we participate and scientific theology is the work we do in engaging and understanding it and sharing that with one another so to say the broad vision of what science and theology on the frontiers of knowledge about is to say it's possible we have had blinders put up to the point that we're not even seeing reality anymore and we need something to remove those blinders so that we can see the nature of what is there and we need to be in conversations to appropriately do that so that we don't have just one person's vision that's there and we collapse into their vision, but that it truly is a community of explorers or learners who are on this journey and together learning what it is that's going on. So that's just to look at, uh, briefly at the title of the book. So the ordering of what we know and how we know is critical. And so, again, we've already begun looking at this. So I can say knowing can be an openness or an awareness to what is other. And if the other happens to be a person, to say we have to just start by just shutting up and listening to the God who speaks. So that would be one of the ways to get knowledge. And the other is for ourselves to say, let's see, how does this fit into what I've seen or heard before? How does this fit into the world as I already know it? And so that, that means that the lenses are all going to be humanly shaped. They're not going to listen as well. Um, the beginning of some classes when I teach on TF Torrance, I'll say, you know, can I just get a volunteer to ask a few questions of and to play with here a bit? And I say, 
And so I was in, in New Zealand, actually, at Tabor College. Uh, and so a woman in the front row said, you know, you can use me. And it's like, so I'm going to I'm going to throw out some things about about this woman. And I said, you know, she's obviously a woman and she looks like she's about between this age and that age. And she's here. So either she doesn't have kids or her kids are are with somebody else. So either she's, you know, single. Um, she, she looks pretty well dressed. So I'll just assume that she's probably um, not married. And I just went on unpacking from the categories that I might get by just observing her. And then when I had done about five minutes of that, I said, now, how well do I know this person who's sitting here? And basically, they all said, well, not very well. All you've done is put your ideas, and they some of them may be true, <laughs> but you put your ideas onto her. I said, that is the nature of a social constructivist or a natural theology reading from our categories onto someone, and they may or may not be true. What do I need to do to really know who this person is? And they said, well, you probably need to, to ask her some questions. And I said, okay, you know, what's what's your name? And so she told me your name and, you know, are you married? Yes, I am married. And again, it sounds like my questions are shaping the conversation and at some level they could be, but I was giving her the space to be who she is and to speak. And with each question she asked, I just asked more questions to pursue. Oh, you're married. Do you have children as well? Yes, I do. How old are they? You know, what do you do with them? And so that was the heuristic process of letting her inform my knowledge and that my questions were simply creating the space for discovery. Now, if there were 10 different people, they would each have additional questions to add to it. And at some point to say, what are we missing here? What are the things that you know about yourself that we wouldn't even know, but that you can tell us? And so for her to, again, then to unpack that, that is the attitude that is attempted to be laid out by T.F. Torrance and Karl Barth really in the distinctions between a proper theology and something that is constructivist or um, is simply getting the ordering wrong. And so the ordering here, what we know first is essential. Is it the mind knowing or is it rea the reality known? So to say the mind knowing is what I did when I brought my categories and tried to fit this person into it. That's the mind shaping the process of knowing. And TF's gonna say that's problematic. Knowing must be determined by what is given to be known. And so when I said, you know, tell me these things about yourself, now I'm availing myself to this other whose revelation then fills out the content and opens each, each, question opens the door to more and deeper kinds of questioning. And so that is the methodology that's being pursued here in scientific theology. How are we related to what is known? Uh, we cannot speak as though we are cut off from our knowing of, real, of reality. So in many ways, when we think about truth in the world that at least I grew up in, truth was this whole set of things and God's truth is all locked up somewhere and something that's like a huge computer in the universe, not unrelated to Plato's understanding of the realm of the forms, the perfect form of a chair, <laughs> the perfect form of, of all these things. So if, if truth is just this thing that's out there, that is something we don't have absolute access to, then we are in a sense not related to the truth. And so to say for T.F. Torrance in the person of Christ, the truth comes to us personally and is not merely a concept or an idea, that's one side of the dualism, but it comes to us so that we will personally be known. And if we only look at the historical Jesus and what can be validated by other people who lived at that time, if there aren't quote unquote unbiased people who are giving a report of the history, then some people say, well, that's just made up by the church. And so they're dismissing the nature of all that Jesus would have said or his disciples as possibly being created. And so that's all collapsing into the historic side without listening to the one who is self-revealing. So the truth personally coming to us, that is the nature of what it is that, that the theological method of T.F. Torrance is pointing us to. So we're related to the truth because the truth is a person, comes in person, and therefore we have a personal knowledge 
Again, that's Michael Polanyi's classic book of the one who we don't know absolutely and entirely in the comprehensibility of it, but we know the one through whom the discovery process begins to unfold because this God wants to be known and wants us to know that we are known as well. So we have to do with the knowledge of God and the world by humans who are constituents of the world. So we can't, we can't assume that we are separate from what it means to be humans in the world. Um, we are part of this world, and so we have to engage as God comes into the world. That's why the incarnation, the coming of God into the world, is the starting point for scientific theology. The nature of the objective self-givenness of God in the person of Jesus says that we don't just look out the window to try and find Jesus. Um, we look at where God has given God's self in the person of Jesus. And just one final quote there from T.F. Torrance. By the way, I quoted all the places. You can see them I'm at the bottom where all of these ideas are coming from. The fateful consequence for the whole history of thought in the West is the neoplatonic disjunction between the intelligible world and the sensible world reintroduced into Christian thought by St. Augustine. So you'll find there are places where T.F. Torrance will affirm St. Augustine. But when it comes to um, this basic point of duality, uh, Torrance, Bart, Colin Gunton famously takes on Gunton and has taken a lot of fire in the last decade for quote unquote not not reading Augustine properly. Um, so the nature of Augustine, um, Augustine grew up in a world where Neoplatonic thought was significant. And again, to in an oversimplified way of thinking to say, um, Plato lives in the world of ideas. So he's the one side, the world of ideas. And Aristotle, in a sense, is the one who organized the world into subjects of thought. And so Thomas Aquinas builds on Aristotelian thought. So that's looking at the, the practical, visible side of the dualism. So to say anything in Christian theology or the history of the church that chooses either a form that looks at the ideas about God or focuses just on the organization of God based on a rationality of human thought, those are generally going to be seen through the lenses of these two great philosophers. And if you were to look at Colin Gunton's book, The One, the Three, and the Many. He has quite a significant discussion of really unpacking not just um, Augustine in his original context, but what would be called the reception history, the way there are things that Augustine may have intended one way, but people take these things and they tend to develop them in ways that aren't true to the nature necessarily of the original person. So to say when we are looking here in this book on reality and scientific theology, we have to recognize that Augustine may be one who introduced thoughts that became very significant in Western Christianity that uh, became problematic in doing, in engaging with the, the living person of Jesus Christ. Um, though Augustine has some wonderful quotes. And I mean, he has some things that, that are helpful, but then he does other things like the confessions, um, famously for Gunton especially, the confessions were his internal gaze. And to say, Augustine sent the world of Christian thinking internally to be spiritual was to have this inward gaze, to confess who one is and all that. Did Augustine intend that to be the direction that he took Western Christianity? I don't know that it was, but it is part of what came. A friend of mine did his PhD on this question of Gunton and, and Augustine. He said, there are a lot of things that Gunton may have missed, but the one thing that is actually quite affirmable is that Augustine started Western Christianity on the inward turn. And to say that it's an inward turn is also to say there's an inward and an outward. And so that implies there is a dualism there. And that we've chosen something that is the spiritual rather than engaging with um, with that which is the other in a Polanyan, Torrentian kind of personal engagement where we value both the inward and the outward, but the outward reality shapes the nature of, of who we are as internal beings. And we are never satisfied if we don't include both of them.
to be spiritual should never be to separate from from the world or into ourselves. It's never a private journey. It always is always a community journey. So that's part of the scientific piece here to say that science isn't just the method. It's also the community of people who become corrective of one another in the process. So yes, Brighton's got this wonderful word, cultivating receptivity, which um, that word came up when we talked about your, your book, Brighton. So to say the nature of cultivating receptivity is both an openness to that which is other, and then also um, building the recollection as a community project of recollecting as we engage the other so that it becomes receptive, transformative, even metanoia, the change of mind because of reality. And Howard says, sounds like a good corollary to Travis's idea of God revealing himself last week. Yes, it's all very consistent. This this whole book is very consistent with what we looked at last week. Um, but it expounds even more. And he does refer to this book in some of the sections that he talked about last week. He referred to this book as a primary source for further discussion on, on those topics. Um, there's a ton more to be said in chapter one. It's got a lot of history that, that we're not going to deal with. But does anybody have any questions on chapter one before we move beyond that? Actually, Marty, can I ask you a question about Augustine? Yep. yep. Because I, I was talking with Mike Habits a bit about this and Gunton, and and I know because I remember when Gunton came to uh, Regent, yeah. <laughs> Jim being an Augustinian, there are just you know the way he you know he, Jim would always complain like no one can critique Augustine because no one's read all of Augustine, and you surely haven't read all the critiques of Augustine. But yeah. but, but but something Tom Noble said at that conference last time when we were talking about anthropo theological anthropology versus crystal, cr the Christocentric interpretation. He, he sort of hinted at, and you, you picked up on that too in your thoughts, that Augustine sort of gave us a theological, you know, and much like you're talking this inner perspective, and, it, and then we asked the question, well, you know, how has that affected our Christocentric interpretation? And then yeah. just what you were saying is that it's not that Augustine's intent was that, but that's not exactly what happened. And, you know, because I was thinking, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily where we're, where we're at, but the situation revelation uh, with Thyatira and, and this idea of, of uh, Jezebel, the prophetess uh, and her children, you know, and, and, and I was sitting there thinking, August Augustine and his ideas affected so much in the church because even when I was when I was talking with Mike, he said, "Well, who isn't Augustine?" You know, because I was critiquing and I was saying I don't like Calvin because if it wasn't for Calvin allowing the the bankers to charge us interest, we'd be in a different culture. <laughs> you know, and that's one of these children. Yeah, yeah, and so the process of becoming corrective and recognizing those things. One can glean from Augustine good things, and one should, but the very process that we're talking about here, where we become corrective as a community, is the invitation to really be a community who, who both honors as well as corrects. Medicines come a long ways because we recognize that there are things that we needed to learn about how to deal with the human body. So you don't have to throw everyone out for that. We can still recognize um, Copernicus and Galileo and all these people for the contribution they did make. Um, same thing with Augustine and Luther. I mean, there there are problems that they had in their thinking. Augustine's analogy of the Trinity is sometimes called the psychological analogy. It builds on, and if I, I'd say it's understanding the will and what's the third word he uses? Memory. 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 So, I mean, though, that's, that's his analogy for the Trinity. And you can see they're all based on a human being looking at their own experience of, of the world themselves. And you can see for someone like T.F. Torrance, um, that would be problematic because you're looking at the human and the structure of the human to try and get to an understanding of God. So maybe that wasn't all he was intending, but a lot of people have exactly taken that beginning point looked at their own sense of those and gone, oh, I can see I'm one person and I have these three parts. Maybe I can figure out God that way. But 
memory, <laughs> will, and so forth, they are not three persons, they, they are elements. So again, one can see that in, in the attempt to make helpful strides forward, it's easy to miss the proper ordering of letting God speak and inform us what the nature of the Trinity is all about. So if, again, for Torrance, chapter six, you know, if you look at the person of Jesus, Jesus is going to say that he comes from the Father and he brings us back to the Father. There is this other who is Father. And the Spirit's the one who placed him in the womb of Mary. And by the Spirit, he's resurrected from the dead. And the, he's going to ask the Father to send the Spirit. We come to know the Spirit through the life and ministry of Jesus who reveals the Spirit to us. So that's that's more of the revelatory character of what it is that T.F. Torrance is wanting to do in what he's building on chapter one. Well, another question to do with that again, in what way would you say the city of God in his interpretation of bringing the, the, the kingdom of God here in the now, you know, in order to hold culture together? Because he was in a very difficult time. But the thing is, there's all these unintended consequences that have, that have paralyzed the church because, you know, the hangover, because even Jim would say, even as an Augustinian, and and Mike was saying, well, who who is an Augustine? But but this idea where he was saying Gunton and um, and Tom were were looking at these interpretations of these children with these ideas that they were dualistic. But you know, but that's the problem. We're stuck in this. We don't have a unified reality. And then and then the speculation about how the church was supposed to take over the government of the world, which wasn't our job. We're we're in the world, but not of the world. And now. Everything we do, the church is reduced to one of these social justice things. When we're not social justice, we're talking about saving people from death and giving them life. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's all kinds of issues of sele selectiveness in terms of how we fill out all these terms. And that is the task of the community to become scientific and to ask the question, you know, what is it that the person of Jesus who brings the life of God to us, what does he call us to do in participating in the places that he calls us? to be obedient to and reflective of his will in the ways in the ways that we might. Bill's question, a critical realism that is active but not factive. The word fact is an interesting word. We, we tend to give facts a content that comes out of a platonic kind of vision that fact is an unquestionable something. The word fact, and this is building on the work of Parker, Parker Palmer, fact means human made as in manufacture or art fact. And so to say that there is a sense in which a good scientific community will create words to serve us, it's created by the human, it'll serve us in knowing the other. And so to say our theology is all an artifact of what's gone before, including Duane and what you're saying, that Augustine is part of the artifact of our faith. And some of those things have to be seen, oh, that was the point where we went using leeches in medicine instead of when we got to the point of you know something else that was <laughs> was used to heal it. So it may or may not have done something. It may have given people a placebo effect that you know gave them something. I I don't know, but to say we have to allow our, the word facts to be humble as well. Insofar as I know this, this seems to be the current state of how we would use this to be a fact. So it doesn't mean you're, we're denying the reality of it. It just means that we have to humbly confess the facts that we have and leave them open to being revised in light of the reality to which they point. But Marty, you realize, of course, that, uh, that maggots and such are back on the medical scene again, that they found out they do work. So it's not a matter of throwing it out, but constantly yeah. being in conversation and changing it. That's right. We may discover that something we we thought we'd found something better. There may have been something in the ancient thing that we need to go back to. And at some level, T.F. Torrance is going back to the early church fathers. Um, he is he is doing exactly that. There's something that we got away from here that we need to pay attention to again. So your point is well taken, Howard, that um, just because we think we found something better doesn't mean we shouldn't go back and study more thoroughly uh, th those other things there. And they may have gotten, you know, 50% right, but then they took a wrong turn. And so to go with them insofar as they were right um, is, is a very help helpful thing. And I think to say T.F. Torrance is more Athanasian and C Cyrillian than he is Augustinian is to say he doesn't want to throw out Augustine, but he does want to critique Augustine in the light of 
these others who he thinks give a more um, adequate way of thinking in line of what it is that's being laid out in this book. Even though this book is not focusing on the early church fathers, they are scientists in my mind. And chapter chapter one of my book on, well, actually chapter two, um, will have the, a biblical study of the science of the personal and just the whole nature of scripture revealing a personal God. Um, but chap chapter three then is on the early church fathers as early scientists who begin to give us language and constructs of thought to understand the validity of the personal um, not to be written off in, the, in a, the way that our modern psychological approaches tend to do, where we are seen as objects and not fully as persons. So the nature of a, a proper theology as outlined in this book is to, to reassert the world is not merely a set of objects. Humans are not merely objects. God is not merely an object, though you could say they, there is an object there. And this is where the word fact, as you used it, Bill, we can say it's a fact that each one of us are, have shown up here, but that doesn't mean that we understand the depth of all that is implied in the factuality of their showing up, why we're here, what it is we're thinking, all those things would be part of a discovery process. And that's what putting things up in the chat um, allow that further process of coming to understand the personal meanings be, beyond the facts. So facts are, they just get us through the door but there's a whole bunch, whole bunch more there to be discovered. And again, to say the nature of contemporary psychology is that if you can't prove a fact that this disorder meets a set of criteria, then this person doesn't have the disorder. That is all fact-based that doesn't see the person. And so to say family systems therapy says, well, we will only know who you are in the history and context of all the relationships in which you live. So we have to understand the whole system of relationships. That's a much more Terencian way of understanding things where the factuality is dynamic and extensive. And we there's always going to be more to, to discover at some level. We can, there isn't a finality to it. It's a, always going to be a discovery process. And and Torrance was passing it on from uh, John John Major. John Major is one that that he uh, he he affirms. There are other people who are Cal Calvin scholars who doubt Torrance a little bit here, but you know doubt's good for the soul. So to say that the that John Major was a was a major person is true. Um, I don't know. That's the only one that that we would put out there in that, but that may be going beyond my knowledge sitting here today, but I think there's more to be discovered on the complexity of the contributions. Torrance has a very elastic and extensive mind, and he's often oh. borrowing from multiple places to come up with what he says. So he sometimes names them and sometimes they just they just kind of show up there. Hmm. Marty, going back to your idea of looking at terms of social relationships, that almost sounds phenomenological philosophically speaking, uh, which is it leaves an awful lot out of the picture. Right. Well that that's gonna be that's gonna be one of the points of the chapter that Bryden has mentioned on the coefficient, the nature of the coefficient, the social coefficient is that we as a community can't create <laughs> the thoughts, but we can observe, reflect on, and say, did you see what I saw? Do you think this is going on? Let's ask some more questions here because it appears that this is reality and uh, we hadn't seen this before. And so for someone like Einstein studying the nature of light, the speed of light and, and all those things and the nature of relativity that comes from it, um, light itself didn't change, but Einstein came to, through metaphors and thinking from points of perspective, he came to see more than it had been seen before. And it also opened him up to understand the nature of gravity and how it worked. So to say something may have been there for centuries, millennia, I don't know what the word is for billions, but anyway, uh, it may have been there all along, but we somebody gets the insight to see what's there and it opens up a whole new avenue of thought. And at some level, that is part of the, of the work that is here in a way that says, Social coefficient isn't a collapsing into human thinking. It is calling human thought to the responsibility to keep asking questions. Did we get this right? Is there something we're missing here? 
and to always be open to, to let those questions show up on the floor to make sure that we're always willing to realign with reality. So the article that hasn't come out yet in, oh, actually it, it is the one that came out in the anthropology issue, my chat, my um, essay on T.F. Torrance and personalism, um, T.F. Torrance in, in this book, several places critiques personalism because for him, personalism is human beings observing other human beings and saying that this is what we must think because of it. So it is it is a form of natural theology, and it it may include God as a secondary conversation, but not as the primary conversation. And so you have a lot of great um, Christian thinkers, most notably Martin Luther King Jr., was a personalist who studied at Boston, which was the American center of personal studies. Um, did he include God in that? Absolutely. Was that his beginning point? No, it was not. It was understanding the nature and function of the human being. Did he integrate that with scripture and all that? Yes, he did. Do we throw him out? No, we do not. <laughs> do we say, let's keep thinking with him. Let's keep thinking of the good that he did. And let's, let's ask how did he see things the rest of us might have missed? And we may have seen some of the ordering that he missed, but together we will come up with a more satisfactory outcome of doing scientific theology. And again, I in the essay, I say that is personalistic thinking in the same way that Torrance isn't into scientism, where science gets to determine what is truth, but rather he follows a scientific attitude, and that is his attitude of letting reality define the thoughts that are called scientific findings. So the ick on the end of both scientific and personalistic for me is a sense of the ordering of our thoughts to align with what it is that he's trying to establish in chapter one, which then goes into shape the argument of chapter two. So chapter two, the status of natural theology. The status of natural theology, this chapter is devoted to the status of what is called natural theology within this perspective. And to say there's a long history of people using the term natural theology. <clears throat> the logical and abstract procedures, which in different ways were employed by medieval and modern natural theology, are found wanting both on scientific and on logical grounds. So again, in a nutshell, if we observe the world in a particular way, which when I was in Vermont, there was a sign that said, put on your seatbelt, it's common sense, right? That's pure natural theology. Most people, if they didn't have to put on a seatbelt, they'd rather not because it's gonna mess up their clothes or whatever. People don't necessarily have common sense that wearing that seatbelt's what to do. So they're appealing to something that's like, I'm going to get, if I'm going to get a ticket for not wearing it, then I'll wear it. But if you, if you just want to appeal to my common sense, I don't know if people would necessarily wear seatbelts. So natural theology in the form that Torrance is trying to correct is a attempt to recognize all the ways that human beings appeal to the common sense that there might be God in the world. And for that, they look at their sense of conscience. Um, they look at the beauty in the world and they say, well, there must there must be a God. But again, all of these are going to be looking at the human. J.B. Torrance, and of course, that I taught from him, said the particular problem that has happened over time is that we, through the lens of natural theology, talk about the ordering of creation. God made men stronger than women. Therefore, he must have made them to rule over them. And so you can see that the observation is largely by men, probably, because the women don't get to speak, and they observe something and come up with something that actually just confirms their position of power. Again, the same kind of things happen with races, where those who were white said, well, you know, God obviously made us smarter than these other people, these other races. But again, it's just a reading in of their own inclinations, and if they actually spent a week in the wilderness with with somebody who was um, able to live in the wilderness and they're not, they might find that these people are pretty smart in their own context. But, but the nature of natural theology is it doesn't consider all of those things. It appeals to what is natural for the individual. 
So again, the demand for a natural relation between the knowledge of God and the intelligibility of the created universe must be met. But again, the ordering is going to be important here. If it's natural based on my sense of what is natural, that's going to be different versus saying there is a God who creates the natural world. How do we understand the created world out of the God who has created it? What are his purposes? What is as his will in the working out of that? That ordering is significant. So point D, a new kind of natural theology can now emerge not as an independent antecedent conceptual system, but one which is integrated with positive or revealed theology. And the word integrated there, you have to see as a secondary integration. It's not as though they stand equal with one another. The integration is the primary is revealed and the secondary <clears throat> is to say, now we acknowledge that the God revealed in the person of Jesus has created the world by the spirit it sustained. Now we can study the nature of what is there and the work of all of the scientific disciplines have their own space. One could see even within the command of, of having dominion over the world in the Garden of Eden, the dominion isn't to, denom to dominate, but it is to become those who know, engage, care for, the world that God has created. So one could say science at some level, just with the naming of the animals even, is the beginning of the scientific process. But it's the God who creates that calls that into being and to, to go forth there. So that is in line with what it is that he's talking about here with this integrated system. There are lots of books on integrating Christian thinking and psychology. The problem is a proper... A proper Christian understanding based on the triune God is a is being in relationship. And psychology has a commitment to the individual with thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of the individual. And the insurance companies know the codes for that individual and what confirms to being a problem and what doesn't. And so to integrate them, you've got a fundamental difference. Is a person an individual? separated from others, or is the individual essentially connected to others, and particularly to the living God? And so integration becomes profoundly traumatic at that point, because they, they really can't be blended together. Though many people try. Point E, we have to be on our guard against the imposition of artificial homogeneities, things that sound like the same, like the word family. And again, the contemporary pushback against social Trinitarianism is to say, well, you take the word family of your human families, and then you say God is a family, but all you're doing is projecting onto God. And if that's all that we do, that would be a problem. But if we stand with Paul, I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now we're thinking about the God who creates as Father, Son, Spirit, the God before whom we bow, the God before whom family has its very origin and derivation. And we ask, to what degree are we corresponding with the word family as God has brought it into being? And so the nature of a natural theology, now we've got it in the right order. We're letting God inform the nature of what it means to be family, to be loving towards one another, to order ourselves in a way that corresponds with who God is and what it is that God is doing. So. We can't impose artificial homogeneities. This is a temptation that regularly arises out of the craving of classical mechanics for necessary, necessary, well, I'm not having a good time with that word, necessary, necessary modes of thought. Why is that such a hard word to say? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Necessitarian, there it is. Uh, and that's, that is in a sense saying that the world has necessary ways of being. And it's very easy to leave God out of it. It's just necessary. There's got to be light and there's got to be gravity. It's necessary for anything to be, is what one would say. And so one just argues from what one creates as necessary ways of the world's being, and you no longer need God. If we recover the meaning of the universe and the meaning of the universe as a whole, we must learn again to look beyond the universe or through the universe to its transcendent ground in the uncreated rationality of God. Again, that's the divine order that is the origin, sustaining, and basis of the order that we find in the world. And so to have our thinking aligned with that is to be doing scientific theology. 
The challenge is maintaining an all important distinction and ordering between the creation and the creator. The creator is the one who creates the order, orders of the world and the orderliness of the world. And so we can understand that the nature of what is made is made by a creator. And so we can ask questions about the nature of what is made. If you begin with the creation, you, you're likely to end up being one of any of a number of religions that worship creation. Um, I remember my Hebrew professor saying, we often misread Psalm 121. I lift up mine eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes to the maker of heaven and earth. And people go out and they look at the mountains or whatever is beautiful there. And they say, you know, I lift up my eyes to the hills. And, you know, God is great. He made these mountains. Um, not recognizing that that's where all of the other nations were worshiping their gods. They were having... The, their Asherah poles and their big worship parties with sex and drugs and rock and roll and all those things. But that the psalmist is saying, I worship the God who makes heaven and earth. I'm not going to get drawn into merely worshiping the creation. And that, that tends to be the problematic of what it is that happens when we lose sight of the creator of heaven and earth being prior to our reading of the creation and holding them in a proper distinction. God creates that which is other to God's self. God will always be other than the creation, though God steps into the creation in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we understand God as God as God gives himself in proper relation to creation by taking creation on to address and engage us. But we we get to know God there. The word became flesh, created and dwells among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Jesus, we see the ordering of the creator to bring our ordering into a proper order to know who God is, first of all, but also all that God creates. So it is only within the, that contingent and semantic reference of the universe to the creator that we may develop knowledge of God that is within the space and time which God has brought into being. That's the created order with the universe as bearers of its rational order and through which he makes himself known to us and summons us to intelligent relation toward himself. So God made the world. God enters into space and time that he has made so that our understanding of the universe would reflect God's kind of ordering and not merely what we observe as ordering. Though we will see things as he has made them orderly, um, but we need to recognize that he's the one that put in order, and particularly with the nature of the human being, the science of the personal. Um, the human left to themselves tends to be self-centered and living in fear and a few other things that are not the true nature of what it means to be human. And again, the problem with families is that left to themselves, usually someone will pursue power over the family. Loving is not a natural thing. It's the gift of God. So point I, there is a great need for a radical reconstruction through a profounder way of coordinating our thought with being. And that is that being comes first and then we reflect on it. John McMurray calls this acting in the world. And then in our acting, our thoughts are being formed. And so that's a reflective moment they're not separate it's all one at the same time so to say that action and reason shouldn't be separated out acting and being it's all it's all one thing and the nature of our understanding when we break them apart is that we get the dualism so john mcmurray was helpful in tf torrance's recognition of the distinction or the the problematic dualism that comes between um thinking and acting or being in the physical world Natural theology constitutes the epistemological geometry, as it were, within the fabric of, re of revealed theology. Torrance talks about geometry. When you just do geometry by itself, it does, it's not connected to the nature of actual things. And so we could say that some people do theology that's not actually connected to the very nature of the reality that's there. But there is geometry that is applied to the physical world. And when it does that, the two are brought together and then can be appropriately applied so that physics 
needs to understand and use geometry appropriately. And so the nature of our theological thinking needs to be seen as a kind of something that we could separate it out, but it's not going to do what it's supposed to do until we bring it to bear on the very life that, that God has created and sustains. And that, that that is where it is intended to be lived out. In this event of scientific thinking, we adopt an approach to the nature of things in which we let reality, which is the title of this book, disclose itself to us. So reality, we assume that there is something there that is reality in its primordial state so that we may apprehend in an, it in accordance with its inherent structures and read its meaning as we penetrate into its own power of signification. So again, this is just the whole orientation of what it is that he, he's talking about everywhere, and that is that we can never do natural theology reading onto the world that God creates, but we always are receptive to hearing and learning from God and all that God creates um, to let it keep teaching us about the nature of the reality that is there. Chapter three, he goes on to just... Um, say and if we do the work that theology is supposed to do and begin with this methodology we're we're going to fundamentally begin with god god's going to inform god not merely our ideas of god or i wish that there was a kind of god or if god was good then god would do this which assumes that we know what good is and we want god to conform to our concepts of good um, all of that is the problematic thinking that isn't letting god be god but is trying to fit God into our little boxes or our systematic theology classes that break God into 10 chapters in a book. And it's like chopping and slicing God on the, on the page. So we have God sliced and diced into all of his attributes, but no longer do we have a God who speaks to us. We just have names for love and justice and righteousness and sanctification and all these things. But there's topics that makes sense to us because of what we get out of it. We feel saved. We feel justified. We feel something. But we've taken it all away from the person who speaks those things into being to us. So the science of God is this letting God speak a pure science of a realist kind and not allowing it to become abstract or idealist with concepts of God that aren't about the God who speaks and acts in a way that is the very place where we draw our conclusions about who the God is, who not only did come to us, but still comes to us. You have a question there, Bill? You've got a inquisitive look on your face. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute too. <laughs> I was just trying to follow along with your um, citation, your footnotes. Right. And I, so I'm on, on chapter three, point B, yeah. theologies of a pure science of a realist kind, not abstract or idealist. I'm I'm and not reading went, everything at this point because I'm just trying to make sure we get it all in. So yeah, you went back to, but on your handout here, you've gone back to the uh, intro, uh, the um, preface. Yeah, you will, you will find the foot, the footnotes revealed that I took the preface and the things that he made as general statements, and I put them in each section, breaking them out into sentences to say yeah. this, this is very much the intention that he had for the chapter. Yeah. And then I, then I have quotes from within the chapter to just play out some okay. of those thoughts. That was the okay. structure of what I was doing there. Uh, by you the way, an observant... uh, what's that? Sorry. What? I said, you're a very observant student. <laughs> well, I am that, a student, uh, but I just want to say thanks very much for this handout. It's it's, it's very helpful. Good. And Good. it's extensive. And expensive? Extensive. Oh, extensive, yeah. Because say, you shouldn't have had to pay for it, but it's yeah. It's not necessitarian, though. Necessitarian. No, <laughs> Hopefully, it will allow allow people to go back and to get the you know salient thoughts and to you know to see the big picture in a few pages. Yeah. So so thank you. Thank I'll you. try and do something basically comparable to this for each of the of the twelve books. In the end, also Carrie Magruder would like me to do an essay for the Participatio Journal issue that comes out in two or three years on T.F. Torrance and science. 
So I will, I'm looking at doing an essay on the 12 books as a whole and what they do in, as a contribution to Torn studies in science and faith. Great. So yeah, so this is helpful for me doing, doing homework as well, so. I, I thought so. Yes, so theology is a positive and progressive inquiry. So that's, I mean, heuristic, right there it is. Positive, progressive inquiry into the knowledge of God. So the science of God is heuristic because it does that. It proceeds under the de determination of God's self-revelation. That's the knowledge God gives. It functions within the limits of our, within the limits of our creaturely rationality. We can't comprehend, but we can appre apprehend. And so as a community, we continue to grow in an understanding of God apprehended based upon what it is that God gives of God's self. And then D within three there, theology is a human enterprise. It is human. We are we are doing the studying, we're doing the reflecting, but it's it's an enterprise working with the revisable formulations in a manner not unlike that of an axiomatic science operating with fluid axioms. So to say there is gravity, there is matter. <laughs> and now what do we do with it? There is water. There, there are oceans. Those are those are givens for us. How do we come to understand the givenness of what is there? So that is the the consistency of the study of God as a science, a theological science, is because we present ourselves as learners before the world that God has given to us and believe that God will both show us God's self, but also all that God um, wants us to see of the orderliness of his creation. Fluid axioms. Fluid axioms. Fluid statements. Um, they're not just mere statements. They're statements that are they're at some level unquestionable. Fluid. Yeah, the word That's... fluid is interesting there. I mean, it's not just referring to water, I think. Um, I don't have an answer to why he uses the word fluid there, because axioms in and of their nature is a truism um, that almost one doesn't question. Though... There may there may be a sense in which he says, but we always need to be willing to confess them. I thought there was a statement, I haven't found it yet, when I first read through the dogmatics in 1991-92, that Carl, I thought he said, we are all heretics. We all get it, we all get it wrong. And so right. we need one another, keep pointing one another back to what is what is true. I still think it's a, it's a, an interesting thought, and maybe I just made it up. But anyway, to huh. say the fluidity of the axiom is to say, I think this is true, but I could be totally wrong, but I'm going to go with this until somebody shows me otherwise. Well, is he putting a heuristic spin upon the word? I that That might be a good way to look at it. That might be a good way to look at it. I wrote an article for Marriage and Family, a Christian journal on recursion, an axiom for Christian counseling. Um, and that is to say that the nature of Christian counseling has to deal with the relationship of knowing and being known between husband and wife, because that's what counseling should do. It shouldn't merely be of something of one or the other or both not being satisfied with the relationship. The axiom is God made us to be with and for one another and to know and be known by each other. And so that should be an axiom for Christian counseling. Hmm. And that that should also include the God who knows us and to know that we are known by that God. So yeah. there are things that you don't find in secular counseling, but I think that they are axiomatic for Christian counseling. So I'm saying this is a, this is a truth that makes it foundational for what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to clarify the relationship so that both feel known, loved, heard, and live in a relationship um, that is truly lived from love so that neither feels judged, rejected, or or anything else from that. So the word actually, axiom... Ma Marty, yes, I was just thinking to respond to that. The, the thing that came to my attention is the refinement of language. Because even we were discussing that earlier, did Tom limit himself to use hypostasis or hypostatic? And I was thinking, well, they, they worked out that language of hypostasis and usia, but is there something deeper or intergirding or undergirding that that actually could be yeah. more appropriate to the subject matter which we're inquiring of? It hasn't been necessarily been revealed that to us, but it's yeah. not that it's because it's fluid. There's the possibility. Is it probable? Yeah. Not necessarily, but yeah. do you have to be open to some new revelation that might open yeah. up a, a deeper level of understanding. 
Yeah, no, I think that's good insight. The word perichoresis was originally used as the mutuality between the human and divine parts of Jesus. It later came to be used of the Trinity, but to say, if you limited it to one and didn't allow it to work for the other, it wouldn't have had the fluidity that it needed to develop into a full Trinitarian description. Yeah, he even uh, used that regarding the homoousios, right? Yep, didn't yep, he? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the fluidity, I think a, a good way of saying that is we have to use the word and also recognize we may come to learn more of it as we go along. Yeah. So we need to create so even the space. creation of onto relations because everybody talks about how he created that like he had to create that language in order to more refine and then now like we we just use it like like it's just you know everyone is Ooh, where did they come up with that word but it's like we know what it refers to based yeah. on all this other stuff and if it's the fluidity of the axiom that's actually brought us to this because, the, because he labeled it we got yeah. something to work with and if you read john mcmurray who wrote um person er, being as communion, no, that was being um, a communion. Uh, being as, being communion is uh, Zazulus. Uh, persons oh, yeah, in relation. Right. Yeah, per persons, persons in relation uh, to McMurray. Persons in yeah, relation the two, the two is from that, onto, that series. Yeah, I can't remember what they're called, yeah, yeah. but they're they overlap it's the form each of the other. Personal. Of yeah. So I'm going to go on to uh, chapter four, the social coefficient of knowledge. So again, we've talked some about this, so we won't deal at at length with it, but here we explore the implications of the mutual relation between God and humans and the com com community of reciprocity in which God, knowledge of God arises. So to say, the nature of who God is as Trinity, existing in relationship, shapes and forms the nature of who we are as humans, both with God as children of God, but also our understanding of the nature of our relationship with one another. And so the nature of what he ex explores in here is the nature of human language, the nature of the social function of, of how we function as something that is worked out of God's way of being. Again, making sure the order is right. That's why it's important to see chapter four coming after chapter three and after chapter two, so that you keep that ordering appropriately aligned to get the, an outcome that is truly a theologically grounded uh, way of thinking about the nature of the language that, that we're using for all these things. Um, Part of, of the book that I'm doing on the science of the personal, indwelling, expanding, and expanding the methodology of T.F. Torrance is to say, we've not had people other than maybe Ray Anderson, some, who've really done the work on thinking about um, therapy in families and communities and church communities um, out of the triune life of God and not collapsing into a psychological model, but that this, this exactly is what this is pointing towards the possibility of. And again, T.F. Torrance himself said that if anybody pointed in the direction to do this, it was John McMurray. He said that in his letter of commendation for um, John McMurray. And the last the last sentence after that, the only other person who's come close to this is Michael Polanyi. So what is what chapter four has here, McMurray is the one he's, who we saw had the best tools and Polanyi came close to it. But in this book, he criticizes Polanyi um, on some of these very points on the nature of person. So um, I'm looking at point H within chapter four. The, per the personal relation then enters into our knowledge of being is one in which we attend to it and for itself and not one in which we value it for our own subjective satisfaction. There's the ordering. This is precisely the mode of personal relationship which we cultivate in community in intersubjective social existence in which persons are rational agents, we can think about our relations in our interaction with other rational agents, each interacting objectively with the independent, free reality of the other. So the word discipleship is maybe a shorthand for all that. We grow because Jesus teaches us. It's lived in the community with other people. We are transformed as the life of God informs and transforms the life of who we are in relationship within the bodies in which we are placed. I'm going to quickly read I2. We come back to the point then that it is the interpersonal structure of our social existence, our openness as persons to one another, firstly to God, but also to one another, in which we share experience of reality and reach communal convictions about it, that's being a scientific community, that develops us in the modes of cognition, 
so we can think because of our interaction, which enable us to engage in objective inquiry and reach objective results. The real objective is that which is shareable, which we can experience together or in common and which is transcendent to each and therefore also to all of us. So this life together is shaped by God, formed in communities where we become who we are in the dynamic of that which no one of us has by ourselves. It has to be formed by virtue of our being part of the community. Chapter five, the stratification of truth. And again, this whole sense, the doxological level is the, the engagement of what happens when one goes to church, when hears the Bible being spoken of, one reads the Bible, one worships, that's doxological, it's entering into a first engagement. And then somebody says, um, I need to understand more of this Bible and the Jesus who's in here. You know, who is this Jesus? Now we're entering into the theological level, the level of the exploration of God given himself in the written word who unveils for us the living word. And we study and then one day we, we go beyond that and say, I hear Jesus keep talking about the one who sent him, you know, who is this one who had come to know beyond just the Jesus who walked the earth? It's like, well, that's the father. And what's this spirit? Well, Jesus didn't leave us alone. He sent his spirit, in fact, to you right here and now. He's the one that's giving you curiosity, the eyes to see. <clears throat> so this is the scientific level beyond that goes into the deep things of God, deep theological thought. <clears throat> But science has come into play here. And each one of those is part of the strata of what it is that would be that would be played out in the nature of understanding not just our surface observation of a church and its worship service, but really delving into all the layers of knowing the person of Christ and through Christ, knowing the Father and the Spirit, and knowing ourselves in that context, seeing that we are involved in that, that's all part of the stratification of truth as well. So they form for us um, visions of, of indwelling heuristically in increasing complexity so that we are understanding more and more of what it is that's going on. And again, there, there are so many examples that one could give of where the church has been insufficient in this. Um, the church talks about people getting married, <clears throat> and occasionally they'll have a marriage seminar or something, but to say marriage is something Paul holds up as something that is an echo of the, very, of the very life of God. And and so the whole sense of saying, I see marriage, how do we understand the God who creates marriage, um, who before whom we mutually submit ourselves to one another before Christ, this is Ephesians 5. Um, what does it look for us like for us to, as a community, to affirm and build one another in such a way that we recognize good marriages need a village also? You know, every child needs a marriage. Guess what? <laughs> so do, I mean, children need a, a, village, a village. So do marriages. Yeah. We have miles to go. And so many people look at Christian marriage and say, oh, I'd never want that. They have a bunch of rules they have to obey. And they can't do any of the fun stuff I want to do. And there's there's just so much confusion because we haven't done the work of what the stratification of work would look like. And when you see a marriage that, that you see as really God honoring, there's a sense of freedom and joy, of mutual affirmation and delight in each other. And they each have ways of being that are different and creative. And you go, the spirits at work here. <laughs> There's love, there's joy, there's peace, there's patience, there's kindness, there's goodness. Um, marriage is not a prison sentence. Um, and so to say the stratification of truth, there's so many aspects of life that learning to really think out of discovering God and then in discovering God to say, how does that impact the eyes that we come to see of all of the engagement of life with all that God has given us to engage? I'm looking at G, I'm still under chapter five. Everything known is known as being or as something particular form of mode or being. All are, and that's that's a quote from Julian Hart's book, Being Known and Being Revealed. Everything known is known as being or some particular form of mode or being. 
All and that was a quote from him. And then Torrance goes on, all our knowledge in this or that science is not simply knowledge of a special field of experience of a particular set of existence or of some complex of relations, but in all such cases of things or events that are, take place in beings. So this holistic thinking. Hence, every concept we have of things carries with it an epistemic relation to the being to the being of beings. And so to, to say there's a sense there of the heuristic never allows us just to see God or a person just as a thing there. Everything needs to be seen in the network of relations within which it exists. So systems thinking is a way, a, a lens that we could put out there. But to say God is the one who informs the system, um, Karl Barth makes a statement that the image of God can never be a male alone or a female alone. The image of God necessitates a male and a female. In his image, male and female, he made them. And that's just a beginning point there of saying, if you think that individual there is the image of God, you're missing the very relationality that stood there in Genesis 127 about what it means to be the image of God. It's necessarily the relationality of male and female, re coexistent, needing one another, and yet not the other. Loving one another for their difference, needing the difference of the other, and yet together forming a unity. The two become one flesh. So all of that is, is played out in what it is that's going on here. The note, note I down there, this is a, I took this from the footnote. Um, he loves Einstein everywhere, but he has a little critique here of Einstein. At these points, Einstein's apparent identification of the personal with the selfish or self-centered world would seem to prejudice him against the personal, so that he retreats into an impersonal model of thought, which nevertheless allows for super personal objects and goals. So again, Torrance is always contending for the science of the personal, because that's where the God where God dwells. Einstein does have this sense. He'll talk about, you know, God doesn't play dice with the universe. He allows for a kind of a concept that's there, but not the personal God revealed in Jesus. So it just shows some of the reservation that can even be there with Einstein when Einstein departs from a proper theolo scientific theology. And the final chapter, the Trinitarian structure of theology. Torrance proceeds with a discussion of the Trinitarian structure that arises under the constraint of God's self-manifestation to us in history as Father, Son, Spirit. So he goes on, to, he's going to again deal with people in history and the way they've gotten off, um, especially Thomas Aquinas, who again, the roots of Aquinas' thought are Aristotelian. Aristotle was logical. He played out definitions and distinctions and broke things down into arguments everywhere. Um, and so the nature of Thomas Aquinas is that he built his, you know, very thorough, in a sense, study of Christianity into the logic based on the work of Aristotle. And so that's why both Bart and Torrance have lots of reservations about Thomas Aquinas. Catholic theologians in the 20th century had a huge um, revival of studies of Aquinas, and that that creates a certain tension among contemporary uh, Catholic theologians and and Bart scholars, because I mean it's actually it's one of the things that I've not had anybody quite explain to me yet why John Webster was going in the direction of Thomas Aquinas when he died, because it is a move into what it is that. Um, is being identified by uh, Torrance here as a move that isn't, it isn't fully staying with the Torrentian commitment to the person of God, but is attempting to build a logic to make sense of God, and the logic precedes the study of God. So that that is a problematic that Torrance is always going to want to avoid, and it's part of what he's saying right up front in, in this chapter. Actually, Marty, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Because I, I think you identified a key problem that we have, the difference between, the, say, the Orthodox as the mid-ground and the Catholic and, and the West, Protestant, that because we know that God is personal, our whole approach to approaching God 
is this personal interaction with God, knowing he's the God who answers. He's the God who hears and he's the God who answers, you know, because we know it's it's after a, it's a, a pastoral experience where in the Catholic Church, then what they might approach if they're approaching God through that logical way, they're not they're missing who the Trinitarian God is in fellowship in the koinonia. And to them, it's an abstraction or else it's 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 some type of mystical experience but again if there's no direct core it's you you have to do something in order to get this god to respond to you by going om or standing on your head or you know it really creates a like how do you get proper knowledge of god yeah well the whole nature of transubstantiation in the catholic tradition that there's something about the bread and the wine being transformed to something that has this you know almost salvific dimension in your taking of it is quite different from the orthodox sense that the Eucharist, we participate in the Eucharist as a participation in the one true Eucharist that is offered by Jesus himself. So the, the priest is bringing us into a personal connection with the one who is offering the meal that again brings us back together. This I'm particularly working out of uh, John Zazulis's work in this. Um, but to say there is there is something more personal in a sense than the in the orthodox understanding that tends to be in the roman catholic tradition which again john mcmurray identified that the the nature of what is called the the fight flight response in humans um developed in in ancient cultures the fight modality wants to manage and control the world and when when the um greek when the roman empire developed it worked from a basic sense of fear of the world and we must manage it and it developed all of the pragmatic ways that have become part of our greco-roman culture today by virtue of management and when we got roads and legal systems and all that that was all rome managing the world out of a basic fear response and when it hit christianity we got roman catholic christianity which managed and developed hierarchies of of the church and canon law and all those things that are a manifestation of what was there in Roman culture, the flight modality in the fight flight is to withdraw from a situation to step back and say, I'm going to think, or I'm going to go to my room, or I need to get it in my head. Whether it's in your head or if in your room, you're withdrawing from the situation. And McMurray identified that as what ancient Greek culture did. And from the Greek culture, we got mathematics and philosophy, all of the abstract things that are so important for our contemporary culture today. And Greek Orthodoxy, when through the different modes of the Eucharist and smells and bells and all those things, one transcends this world to participate in the heavenlies. And that would be when Christianity is meeting, meeting Greek culture. And so it hasn't had the ability to stand against the threat of communism Though at this point, there are things happening in Russia that are, yeah, they're further tragic. We won't go into that whole thing. But anyway, hmm. the statement, you know, it would be nice if the Protestants had taken on what Torrance identifies all the time as the Hebrew culture, a people addressed by God who respond to God and their whole identity is love, not fear that either has a fight or a flight mentality, but love that connects. But no, Rome dominated luther and so the Luth the lutheran mentality was a roman mentality and so protestantisms have tended to be a manage the world control the world divide and conquer and he makes a statement the world is still waiting for a hebraic form of christianity that is grounded in the love of god that both lives personally receiving and participating with god and then acting in ways in the world that are consistent with it do you have That's the a huge, uh, there's the, the hesychasts in the orthodox tradition and um, they're, they're rather like scientific theologians in a way. Um, yeah, it's I all think about, there, are, yeah. there are pieces, there are pieces that are, are like it, but um, he goes, uh, McMurray goes in to say, even in the case of the Jews that Jesus walked with, some of them became Roman, the Pharisees, controlling, law-based. And some of them became Greek, i.e. ran to the hills, the Essenes and um, the mystics who didn't want to confront what was going on. So they removed themselves. So even, even in Jesus' own time, you have the fight flight as a dominant motif 
and I, th I think you're probably right that there are there are groups here and there who get it a bit. Um, but to say that they've they have been able to bring into the fore the nature of a Christianity that really reflects the intuition of what it means to love from the love of God and as a a whole culture to reflect in the world, we have yet to see what that looks like. And we can argue whether or not there are church traditions. I think there are individual churches who get better at it until the budget gets tough or the building gets too expensive and the fear the fear comes in. And to say most movements begin with a love for God and a love for changing. The day somebody says, I'm afraid we're going to lose this. We need to get leadership here. We need to incorporate or we need to come up with a set of rules to make sure we stick the day that fear sets in is the day that institution at some level begins to die. The book, the book, Howard, that that is the easiest one to access that in is The Clue to History, John McMurray. Okay, I'm sorry, one more time. The Clue to History. There are, I think, three books that mention it, and I think that I have some of that in my, my doctoral dissertation, which is available. I think you may have that. And it's also, well, I talked about it in volume three of my face-to-face -face series, also as a discussion okay. of the okay. three ancient cultures. And I talk about but it, three cultures born born in the cradle. A child is born and out of it comes yeah. a child who either yeah. learns to love or they live in some form of fear. Is there a section in that one? Dwayne, you're on mute. Dwayne, you're on mute. <laughs> It works I very can well. See your lips. <laughs> Dwayne, we missed all that because you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. So that's a selection of John McMurray's work that, that comes from a, a number of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your comment, though, about um, control and management? Uh, yes. I have a, a, a very good friend who was Protestant. He became Catholic. He has embraced it fully. And basically, it's not a, so much a relationship with Christ, but it's a relationship with Christ mediated through the church in various ways. Yeah. He can stop anywhere and find a spot on the map and know exactly what to think, what to believe, what to do. And yeah. his wife is even more so. She's very regimented in that and i remember a lot of that from my own catholic days and that's that's yeah. very eye-opening i need to follow that some more yeah and mediation itself is not the problem i mean jesus is the mediator he mediates the love of god and so to say it is very possible for a a leader in a church to mediate the love of god and to be somebody who facilitates that in the life of the community in such a way that the the very character of the church is one of love the first article I ever published in Crux is called The Trinity and Familia Ecclesiology. And my argument is we need to train people differently, not merely to be dispensers of information through sermon and counseling. They need to be formative of bringing the life of the Trinity, the love that is there, to the whole of the community. So there's going to be more visiting of people and knowing and having conversations, finding out where there are conflicts between them more shaping the family to function together than downloading information. So that's the basic basic argument that I have in that article. I'm gonna go back to, to um, our final sections here. Um, e, the Christian understanding of the person in relation to personal activity of the Holy Trinity is then essential. So to say, the whole nature of the triune structure of, of theology revealed, revealing the God who exists in relationship becomes formative for the very nature of who we are as communities and as persons within it. He has several different sections here, which we just don't have much time to go through them all. I'm going to go to G there. Through personal interaction with us, God creates reciprocity between us. This is a quote from him. By encountering us as personal being, God at once brings us into a personal relation with himself and prevents us from including him within our own subjectivity. So not collapsing us into him into our thinking. 
for it is as the thou, the transcendent other, that's personal, that he meets us and makes us, makes himself known. He both distinguishes himself from us, he's the creator, as an independent reality over against us, capital R reality, title of the book, and indeed as Lord God of our very being, and at the same time posits and upholds us before him as persons in relations of mutuality and freedom with God and with one another. That's the fullness of the personal outworking of the Christian faith where the theology informs, transforms, invites, brings together in dynamic ways what it means to be the family of God and also to be that with and for one another and probably in the neighborhood too. Um, in some of my classes, I have people go out and interview people in the houses within a block of the church they go to and just say, you know, what are your thoughts about this church? <laughs> Most of them are frustrated because of parking issues or no, nobody's ever come or they come um, trying to download heavy theology on them. Very few find neighbors within a block of the church who actually feel loved by the church that is their neighbor which is a bit tragic. Point J, I'm skipping over a bit here. I submit that it is only through a divine trinity who admits us to communion with himself in his own transcendence that we can be consistently and persistently personal with a kind of freedom, openness, and transcendent reference, which we need both to develop our own personal and social culture and our scientific exploration of the universe, the heuristic movement. I believe that it is in a it is in a radical renewing of our personal and interpersonal structures that comes from communion with God that we are to look for a healing of the deep splits which have opened up in our modern civilization. And again, that that was being written in 1985. We haven't quite figured it out yet. But to say theology ultimately is what brings healing even to the political situations of the world because of the social dimension. If it is left to itself, it will enter into either abstract ways of thinking. We are the people that God loves. You know, God bless America. God bless whoever. That It's an idea that becomes nationalistic and God is just put on the wall as a picture. Really, it's the nation that's being affirmed, which is problematic. Or... God is brought in as a justification for political systems that really don't look at who God is, except as it serves the political system that's being used. That, that's the dualism, again, that's there. And T.F. saying, ultimately, our scientific theology has to have a God who engages, calls us back to the factuality of God in all of its fluidity, to be continually in dialogue and communion and transformation, so that we, in fact, have people say, these people have spent time with Jesus. See how they love one another. See how they love their neighbor. That there's something of authenticity that the very life of God informs the nature of who we are. The last statement, human beings need to be turned inside out in a profound inversion of their self-centeredness and be anchored in a transcendent center of love in God if they are to be persons freely open to one another and the universe which God has created. So there you go, book one in the series of 12. The next one's a thicker book yet, but it will, you know, we'll try and keep it focused. People will have had less exposure to it. Book two is The Circles of God, Theology and Science from the Greeks to Copernicus by H.P. Nebelsik. So anyway, um, he really builds in this book, I think, on the first chapter of what Torrance just laid out, the historical dimension on the nature of science that will be played out there. Do any of you have that book? No. No. So that's book two. That's what we'll look at next month. Now, next week, we will have Tom McCall and Tom Noble discussing the annual Torrance lecture that was given in November at the American Academy of Religion. Actually, it wasn't there. It was supposed to be there, but 
it was recorded. And so there, there is already, I, well, actually I will be putting up a link tomorrow. Um, so you can watch that lecture. And if you have questions, um, I've invited Tom Noble, who was there at the AAR saying, where's the lecture? <laughs> <laughs> like, so we had we had to talk to Brent and Carrie. They said, "Oh, it was recorded um, three weeks ago." It's like, well, we missed it. We missed being able to get feedback. So, so Tom Noble um, said, "You know, I wish I could have interacted." And I said, "Well, let me see what I can do here." And so Tom McCall, who gave the lecture, agreed to um, have this session with us. Oh. So I'm encouraging people to watch the lecture that he gave. I'll give you the link. Watch the lecture and then come with questions and comments. To engage the two the two Toms and Tom Noble again is one of the great living Torrance scholars today. He's there in the UK primarily at Manchester, um, and so that will be a, a wonderful and unique session next week. Does anybody have any final questions or comments related to uh, the nature of what it is we looked at in this book today? Well, I'll have one that takes us down a rabbit trail, but I'll let others speak first when they, they pertain to the cut. The, well, the rabbit trails can that. end up with good rabbit stew, so. Well, this is more of a personal <laughs> anecdote. Uh, I have a young friend who's actually a son of a friend I've known for like 50 some years. And uh, about every five years, he has a crisis and meltdown in his faith. He's pretty much evangelical, but he recently contacted me and he was, uh, he'd been listening to some Orthodox pre, uh, commentators, podcasters on faith. And it really raised some questions of him from his evangelical upbringing and steeping. And so he came to me and said, you know, what's going on? Who's right and who's not? And I said, boy, do I have the person for you. So we've had three, three pretty long discussions on Torrance. I sent him a bunch of material. And then I found out he lives about an hour away from Dubuque, where, where Elmer Collier is. And I had invited him to reach out to Elmer. And he responded to my friend immediately. He gave him the, the TF Torrance uh, link, which I guess Collier was actually instrumental in setting it up. And he's sending it, my friend his book. But the question that came up in my mind, have you had Collier on the Zoom? Or was he, has he been here? Is he willing to come? I, I'd like to yeah, hear him. I had, I had a session with Elmer. He's a little bit hard to get hold of, but I did have one session with him. I think it was when we did the T&T Clark handbook. I think he did a chapter and we did a session with him. So okay, that'll be I listed on that, the... Yeah. It'll be it'll be there on the TF Torrance Fellowship website in the reading group section. Everything that we did is recorded and is there. Yeah, yeah. So oh, it is available. I, just, I was just very impressed with <clears throat> Dr. Collier. He was very. Yeah. He said he responded almost immediately to my friend, and he sounds very eager to help him yeah. in his uh, search for Torrance. Um, I mean, yeah. he's he's got a pretty good grip already from our discussions but uh yeah I, you know i'm very envious i'd like to be part of that you know <laughs> yeah and of course travis studied with collier oh, so right. travis okay. is another good person to study up with as well bill okay i may pass that also, along also howard on the uh, gci.org website the video interviews you're included i think there are about five interviews with Elmer. oh really I yes. think I've seen one about one of them, but that was it so far. But I'll have to check that out. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So. One other thought that you just raised for me, Howard, is as we've talked about science today, that science is this sense that there's reality and we reflect on it. The word faith itself becomes synonymous with science at that point. Faith is engaging the other and having our thoughts formed and transformed in such a way that they conform to the reality that we are, are, are that is before us. So <clears throat> if you have faith in a person, it's because they are faithful and you've come to know them. And so to say that the fact that you've come to trust them is to see the consistency of who they reveal themselves yeah. to be so that your faith is because of their faithfulness. And so again, the word science and faith, when appropriately held together, becomes synonymous.
Hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, that's been the the focus of uh, that theological debate on faith or faithfulness. How do you interpret that word? I've come yeah. to very strongly believe it is faithfulness. It yeah, is the, the faithfulness of Christ that yeah. makes it work for me, not because I happen to believe believe and click my heel three times and say there's yeah. no place like Torrance or something, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I like to see that. That's better than Marty's is a uh, triunity uh, tri -unity prayer there <laughs> you gotta add that to yeah. your step <laughs> it is it is possible today with people who are are dealing with things as your um as this person is for you howard to say you know let's just talk about science for a minute you know uh -huh. is science grounded in really knowing the world as it exists and coming to understand through that how we appropriately live in the light of it and mm -hmm. then you know if they say that it's like well, you know, my understanding of the nature of theology or faith is coming to understand the world that God creates and still maintains and living yeah, in the light of good. it. So, you know, I'm not I'm not wanting to anything that is a leap into the dark or making things up. Or as one person once said, you know, I I have a hard time with people who have imaginary friends, which someday I have an article that I've I've got the outline of it done up on just answering. <laughs> Those yeah. who think Christians are just those who have imaginary friends, um, to say that the nature of of science um, permits us to ask, you know, what is there in the world that best explains the world um, in such a way that that it's made sense of, and to say, and I, I remember in New Zealand sitting with a faculty member from the Faculty of Science, who when he heard us a theologian, he says, you know, you know, haven't you heard about the God of the gaps? You know, uh -huh. that all God has done is to bring in answers to the gaps. And I read just two days ago, um, chance is the new God of the gaps, that the nature of evolutionary argument basically uh -huh. says everything from why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there life rather than not life? Right. Why is right. there DNA, which is an organized information system? Each one of these things that all of them... Um, that there are no answers for these things. We haven't discovered it yet or whatever. They are all basically functioning as the new God of the gaps, except it's the anti-God of the gaps. Yeah. But it wants to plead the same arguments. And so to say, in both cases, nobody was there at creation. Nobody was there at the beginning of life. Nobody was there at the, the formation of whatever became DNA. So we have to ask, what makes most sense that it is designed, this is T.F. Torrance, that it's designed by a... a organizing being who gave it its order its meaning its purpose or that it's all chance and it's still all chance uh, and this yeah. was this is mcmurray's last chapter in the book um the persons in relation is the personal universe that the bit the basic question to be asked is is the universe personal or impersonal? If it is impersonal, it is all chance and nothing has any meaning other than what we read onto it. If it is personal, then all of the universe has meaning and purpose down to our very life existence and everything we do and say. Mm -hmm. And at that at that point, one makes a decision at some level and it's, it's hard to sustain the thesis that it's all impersonal. The anthropic yeah. argument that, you know, the we would not exist this earth would not exist as it did if it wasn't finely tuned in a way um that has created the miracle that is our earth existence and what it means to be human beings living on it yeah. so I'm, I'm, actually i'm Marty, trying can to I remember oh sorry sorry howard you know i was just going to say quickly i've uh, i've been listening at probably a half a dozen times i've listened to those 10 lectures on ground and grammar by torrance yeah. And he has a different take on this idea of God of the gaps, which I'm trying to figure out what he means. But he says it doesn't mean what you think it means. It's not that there's, we don't know what how to plug it in, so we put God in there. He said, yeah. the scientist said, well, we'll just, we'll blame God until we figure out what the answers are. So it wasn't, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. A, a makeshift answer. I, I thought that was kind of interesting. I had never yeah. heard that before. We will be going through the book in the reading group um, the Ground and Grammar of Theology. I think that's the one that comes after our current reading in yeah. the Christian Doctrine of God. And so I will, I'll will i be posting the corresponding lectures with the text. And so we can bring that up as, when we get to it and see if we can explore yeah. a little bit more what he's thinking. Yeah, okay. I definitely should sure. post those. I found them. Well, uh, actually, it was Ted 
pointed me to the GCI site that has yeah. those lectures. And yeah. oh man, it's they're great. I just they are great. I take my dog for a twenty minute walk, and I listen to twenty minutes of <laughs> Torrance and uh, good exercise my dog is, of body and mind. Yeah, well, the dog is turning into a Torrensian as well. So <laughs> as long as it doesn't get too dogmatic, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sir, sorry, Marty, can Dwayne, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Marty, I want to go back to something you were doing last week because I think this would be very helpful for all of us when we're meeting people. When we were because getting to this whole anthropo anthropological, when we start with our own nervous system, you you reduce the you know an existentialist where they get started off and where they end up yeah. and these different themes. Could you could you just be do do a creative list? Of, of these bullet points at how you see how this logic forms where they they start at this point in their own nervous system with this philosophical orientation you know and that's in this existential category there are a couple yeah. three categories that you just rattled off where they, they go off the track because that's where a lot of people think is if they had these categories in this language to identify where they're starting from then we can yeah. show how you how you, you're not understanding that God himself is another subject and you approach him relationally. And, you know, I think that would, because I know for myself, I'd really appreciate you to do that work for me because it would make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I mean, you take every ist, I mean, you take, you take all those, is, all those isms, like all these different isms, because most yeah. of us aren't like, even because we're using all this language, but the average person doesn't know this stuff. But if we can reduce it in such a way, so this is what, yeah. this is the, how it starts, but this is where you end up with this type of thinking in a yeah. shorthand. So you can help see, well, this is why we reject that out of hand. Like we're starting off with this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a priori arguments, and and it's a closed system, so that it, it you know it it's it's what is it? Um, it's objective. It's 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 static uh, subjectivism. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it has no it, you know, and then it just and then you use it as a hammer to beat people with everybody else's ideas. That's yeah. what ends up happening because they're not close to the relationship where something else actually informs them to change. Yeah. Well, all of the, you know, existentialist begins with their own existence. A personalist begins with who they are as a person. A capitalist begins with their orientation within a basic economy that they want to serve and how they can use the system to serve themselves. Um, so, you know, we can just go on with all of the is and outside of uh, theological thinking, the nature of the history of philosophy is that all of the philosophies find some place for the human to interpret reality and their place within it to serve themselves. So all, all of them are just different logics that, that play out from that. Yeah, see, but that most you would the only way you can understand is because you have the mind of Christ, because you can step out inside yourself you and can, observe the way God sees it. You can't yeah, see yeah. that in the natural state. Yeah. <laughs> or, or they, so or think, they, or they, they try and critique each other's thoughts, but they can't realize there's one overgirding reality where yeah. they never get in contact with reality because they still haven't met the living God. Very good. I think Adonis had a question there. Is that how you say your I, name? Yes. Uh, thank you. I yeah. and I'm very thankful to this for this time with you and for quite time I'm just reading your comments on Facebook and now we are together. I'm from very Philippines good. and uh, from GCI and just want to clarify because when I began reading Torrance uh, through some books, I seem to notice that uh, I want to clarify if he is uh, in the sort of uh, quantum science type in the scientific in his scientific view so the nature of quantum theory is something um Polkinghorn is another science and theology person who says that that is the one thing torrance didn't go on to do there there was work being done in quantum thought um in, in torrance's lifetime but he didn't he never brought quantum theory to the fore i don't know enough of of quantum theory to understand all that might be added by that. And so to say the nature of the work of Einstein and Polanyi, um, as Travis said last week, Torrance really looked to some particular great theologians of the 20th century as the grounding for what he saw as the direction that quantum theory was primarily going. And so the nature of field theory and so forth like that are going to be huge. The the nature of relativity, um, the nature of personal knowing. Uh, I, I'm not aware of anywhere, and I 
Travis, I don't think, gave us any direction, particularly last week, on anything that Torrance engaged on quantum thought. That doesn't mean that there aren't things that could be taken beyond that, but he didn't go there, the, go there himself. There, there was an article that I pointed out last week. This book is called Science and Christianity, The Blackwell Companion to Science and Christianity. It has an article in it on Torrance, but it also has an article in it on, well, it's actually, it's got one on the God of the Gaps as well. It has a, a chapter on theology and quantum theory. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there aren't people thinking about it who would be people who would show up in a book that includes Torrance. So... I'm sorry I can't give you more on that. Quantum is still a, a quantum leap for me to uh, to fully understand. So, has do you McGrath, understand quantum theory? Has McGrath addressed it? Um, I I wish that um, Bryden was here to answer that question. I I don't know if ah. he has or not, and I don't have the the set of uh, books that he has. They're they're quite expensive, but Bright, yeah. Bryden is one who uh, probably could answer that. Um, so yeah. if you if you post that on the TF Torrance reading group, that question, Bryden, he, he's pretty attentive to it. And so I think he would probably yeah. respond to the question as to whether Alistair McGrath has picked up discussion that in includes quantum theory. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I think we've, we have we have done well today. Um, if you have any ways, that, uh, suggestions on how to make these sessions on the books of the 12 uh, more helpful for you, let me know and I'll try and integrate those things in as we as we go along. Uh, so when, that, one last yeah. thing, when David Ford uh, completed his uh, review, his critique yeah. of the book, he said, I hope that the rest of the series is up to the level of this one. Yes. Are they? Are they? Um, in your opinion? So, to uh, to take not my opinion, but Jim um, Neidhart's, he said <laughs> they're not all exactly equal in their quality. Yeah. Um, the question of how each reader reads a text and what their own areas of interest are may have some impact in, on how well and how thoroughly the topic has been addressed. To yeah. say all of them, all of them make a contribution. Um, T.F. Torrance is a pretty tough nut to follow <laughs> from the beginning, but to say T.F. Torrance chose every one of these people to write these, yeah. and in the end, um, Neidhart did say that they were all worth reading. So every one of them does make a contribution, uh, and sh and should be read. So we'll we'll go with that. Right. Raise that question again when we finish the twelfth book. <laughs> And yeah, and we'll we'll see if you can evaluate. The question on the evaluation of books is is always interesting. Yeah, because everybody comes from their own set of judgments. And um, so anyway, hopefully everyone will make a contribution to your thought and give you more insight to Torrance and the vision for the working together of science and theology. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here today. Many blessings on you, and I will see you next week. Thank okay. you.